And so, if Africa was a barren continent, in terms of natural wealth, call it resources if you wish, it would definitely have never attracted colonial settlement, let alone being in the news today. And just like game, which is exposed to fierce predators for devouring, the continent stood and apparently is still standing at the mercy of what we now describe as former colonial powers, that is the West. It may sound a little tricky to say so, but when in 2018, more than half a century after a greater number of African countries gained independence, we still find them lining up to seek foreign loans, then the above assertion has its place. And yes, if the creditors, who are the ex-colonial masters, and today joined by China, are still around, cajoling Africa with those bits and pieces, in the name of loans, it is also largely because there is much underneath the African earth to tap from. We may call it natural wealth. Typical African traditionalists regret that the continent was ever influenced by the West in everything including systems and development. To them, pre-colonial African setups were convenient, and if civilization meant putting on clothes made from grass or backs of trees, so be it. If arguing against this school of thought makes any sense, how would one defend the fact that African or Western-style democracy handed down to Africa is rather seen to one of the curses taking the continent's wings and preventing it from flying the high skies of modern civilization. Granted that Africa was colonized. Granted that the continent accepted western style democracy, the same democracy which prevents even the best, most prominent or performance residents of the United States to stay in power for more than eight years, if ever they succeed in winning a second mandate. The same democratic practice which enables the people to hold leaders accountable and force them to resign if they fail to deliver. The same democracy which allows journalists to tackle top ranking politicians without fear of being thrown behind the bars. The same democracy which obliges people holding public offices to be transparent in every transaction to avoid corruption. Yes, Africa accepted the fact to inculcate such democracy, yet practicing it has been the most difficult assignment ever. Otherwise, how would one explain the fact that some African leaders would cling to power for one, two, three, and even four decades in a so-called democratic setting? How would one understand the fact that the same people, the same names, are recycled for decades, and that in 2018, Africa still has political administrators who worked for and with colonial masters. Or is it easy to understand why after acknowledging failure, and even with great agitation from the people, African political administrators refuse to resign? The other side of the story is the socio-economic mess this poor leadership has plunged the people into. Poor infrastructure, death traps in the name of roads, hunger, poverty, disease, and the list is endless. Perhaps the silver lining in this dark cloud is a new mindset harbored by a young generation that seems to understand the mathematics better. With technology as an inspiration, this generation, which surprisingly appears to be more pan-Africanist in their thinking, sees a better Africa tomorrow if given the opportunity to translate their knowledge into socio-economic and political development. The question, however, is, are they going to be listened to? Who will grant them such opportunity? Is the older generation ready to hand over the battle? An older generation which argues that an old room knows the floor or knows the house better, and that it sweeps better. But which one would make a carpet cleaner? Is it an old room? or an electronic vacuum cleaner. These are some of the reflections of questions Nigerians are asking and pondering on as the country prepares to elect a new president 12 weeks from today. 
around this Nigeria and pondering on these questions is Omoyele Sowori, one of the contenders in the race for the president. Whether these issues mentioned in this editorial are what would have inspired his beat for the highest office in the most populous black country in the world, is what the young candidate doubles as chairman of the newly created African Action Congress and founder of the Sahara Reporters News Agency will be telling us in this edition of Afroethics. Just on a text one way. As a good afternoon to you who join us on the show. If you are just joining the station, this is Apex One Radio, broadcasting from the United States of America. And exactly 12 minutes past 7 in Lagos, Nigeria. Let's kick off the show. All right, we're going to lay the groundwork. Let's do it. Then we will be right back to introduce our guests on the show. Don't worry. Just on Apex One Radio. All right, so as a good afternoon to you joining us on the show. If you are just joining the station, this is Apex One Radio, broadcasting from the United States of America. And exactly 12 minutes past 7 in Lagos, Nigeria. Let's kick off the show. And it's good to meet you. That beautiful piece of music that I told Mr. President by Abuchi Yawano, Nigeria, after I introduced us. By the time, to 13 minutes past one, this is our four edits, the edition of November 32, 2009. So, like we mentioned earlier on, we have an honorable visitor here who is uh, one of the candidates of the 2019 uh, presidential election in Nigeria. His name is Omo Yele Shomore. He is the household name, of course. Right? Executive So at this point in time, we're going to say uh, welcome to our guest. Um, let me call this, uh, Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for bringing me on your show. How the sun was uh, the trick to Columbus? Very good. Right. Uh, you, you perhaps have to uh, uh, handle it. Again All right. Right. And so also uh, uh, on the show, we're going to have uh, uh, the two other hosts alongside me. Are you uh, Kinoli, uh, whom I must say thank you for giving me the privilege because as a matter of fact, it is your show. And uh, we are also joined by uh, Aki Tunde Ademey. Did I pronounce it well? Ademey, thank you. <laughs> so he, he, he's coming all the way from Pittsburgh, in Pennsylvania, to give us uh, host this show. So you're welcome for Aki. Yes, thank you so much, Mr. Omoyali Shore, for joining us on today's uh, special edition. Uh, it's, uh, uh, Nigerian, uh, upcoming Nigerian election is very much on our mind, and um, you are one of the um, contestants in this. Um, <laughs> it's going to be a tight race, I can, I can guarantee right now. So, I want to use this opportunity again to welcome you live from the show Afro Ethics Live on the Big Song Radio, and of course, my co host on this show. My name is Akitum De Ademos. Uh, it is my honor to meet you, and uh, I came all the way from uh, Detroit, uh, Michigan, and I'm a legal consultant in downtown Detroit, and it is my honor to be here. Thank you so much for making it happen. Thank you so much for coming in today, my friend, uh, my everyday friend, Mr. Aki today, Adi Yemo. Let's um, straight up, let's uh, let's kick that, let's kick start this. Let's, um, um, let me start by asking you this question, sir. Um, this uh, political ambition of yours, what is the motive behind your, this race, you know, you, want to be the next president of Nigeria. That's um, the most, um, um, second most populated black nation in the world. Um, the commercial nerve center of Africa. And um, you have been campaigning around, you've been almost all over the world sharing your dreams and um, you know, your aspirations. What is the motive behind this? As, uh, that, at every period in life of a nation, in the life of generations of people, there must be a time when they decide to power their way from failure in the direction of success. A time that they abandon, you know, obsolete leaders and go for progressive leaders. A time for an old generation to give way to a new generation of leaders. Nigeria has reached that point, and uh, those of us who have had experience fighting for what is just, fair, and democratic in Nigeria. I uh, made a decision, very conscious decision in my own particular case, that we cannot make progress, we cannot move forward 
we cannot attain and achieve our potential in the world without new leadership that has the capability, the capacity, and integrity to move Nigeria in the right path of progress, peace, and prosperity. And uh, I'm motivated because I know that I have the capability. I understand Nigeria very well, having fought over the last 30 years against unjust government, I fought against corruption. I have stood on the barricades for 29 years precisely. Gathered enough experience, you know, suffered, been tortured. But I'm not saying this because of any sense of entitlement. It is because it's the right thing to do at this time, and I'm in a better position to take Nigeria to that place that every black person in the world has been looking forward to. Thank you very much. That was a very a brilliant answer from you. And uh, one of the things that people have been saying is that you're a very young man. You know, what kind of experience do you have to? steer a country like Nigeria, the richest country right now in Africa, right? But we tend to forget that all these presidents, you know, from 1960 to 2008, they were first elected or installed where they were probably below your age. Yes. So tell Nigerians who are watching right now why you should be elected. What exactly I want to correct the impression your... that I'm a young man. Yes, I'm very youthful, but not too young. Uh, by United Nations uh, definition of youth, I'm a little bit older than what can be considered a youth. I'm 47 years old. I am older than perhaps the president of Canada at this point. I'm older than the president of France. I'm older than the president of, uh, I think, Croatia. I'm older than the president of a lot of nations around the world at this time. I am definitely younger than uh, dinosaurs running Nigeria. Uh, Take it back! <laughs> <laughs> Action! Action! Yes. yes. Uh, and it's very important uh, to say that when you talk about experience, it depends on the kind of experience you are looking for. If you are looking for an experienced thief, you will not find me to be qualified. If you are looking for an experienced and competent leader, you will not find me as capable. But if you are looking for a person who had an experience fighting for what is just, what is fair, what is right, within the Nigerian context, I am better experienced than any of these leaders we're talking about. You're talking about physical experience of leading people. I've led huge amount of causes in my lifetime. I've led students who fought and brought about the restoration of democracy in 1999 in Nigeria. I've led a media movement that held the feet of those in power to fire over the last 12 years through Sahara reporters. I have led all kinds of courses. I have been a leader, innovative enough to create a digital media platform in Nigeria that was a leading light in the media industry, not only in Nigeria or Africa, but on a global scene, known as Sahara reporters. This is how you know modern day leaders, not leaders who have accumulated stolen wealth, leaders who have killed, destroyed, and decimated their societies. That is not experience. We're talking about despicable wickedness. And we have to be very clear when we talk about experience, what we mean by experience. Uh, I want to say one last thing, and you know, I will name names. When Abubakar Atiku ran for the presidency of Nigeria the first time, it was in 1992. Ask yourself, what was the experience then? Yeah? None. When Buhari became president of Nigeria in 1983 through a coup plot, he was 42 years old. What was the experience then? Well, they could claim that he was a commissioner, he was this, but you know, if you want to really talk about experience, you talk about someone who has done the job before. And Buhari has been president of Nigeria before. Obasanjo has been president of Nigeria before. These are former experienced leaders. But what did that give us? What did the experience do to Nigeria? If, if I may follow up on that, uh, you mentioned that Cheko 
and the article, like you said, uh, was uh, former presidential uh, candidate in Nigeria in 1992. 1992. And then in 1999, he was the uh, vice president of to Russia Gunbasanjo. Yeah, for, uh, for eight years. And he was quite involved in uh, money laundering and bribery schemes in the United States. Absolutely. In the the there. records are there. The records are there with uh, Mr. Jeffrey, a former congressman in the United States. Williams, and yeah. uh, his second wife, his fourth wife as well, Mrs. Jennifer Douglas and Bubaka. Yes. And they are both wanted. In fact, there is a sealed uh, complaint in the Virginia courthouse about this whole thing. And it was subpoenaed several times, but he never appeared for, uh, you know, for, he ran away, yeah. he ran away from yeah. the United States, yeah. including his uh, fourth wife. Now, if you become the president of Nigeria, I have a question for you. Are you willing to bring all these old corrupt people to justice? You see, the question is, if you bring them to justice, I mean, I want to say, let me reframe it. The question is not if you bring them to justice alone. It's about if you bring justice to them as okay. well. Okay. So justice has to be very dynamic. It has to move in both directions. There is no statute of limitation barring anybody who has stolen from big punishment, never the state finds it justiceable to do so. And so that's the way our side. I don't want to do a, sorry, I don't want to delve into things that don't add value to the conversation we need to have now. Okay. Because there's a justice system in place that I would not be controlling directly, but I will mm -hmm. ensure that it's functional in the yes, system. I mean, our, in our country. Mm -hmm. You see, if Nigeria had been able to bring these guys to justice by now, or bring justice to them by now, they will not be running for office. Mm -hmm. They will be in prison. You know, at the minimum, so many of them will be on parole or asking for parole to be out of prison. So imagine if Atiku Abubakar was sentenced to prison after he finished his tenure in about 20, 20, 2007. Let's assume that he got a 20 year um, in jail. By now, he'll still be in prison. He would have been half into his prison term. And Nigeria will not be dealing with whether he's coming to office or not. If Buhari had been sent to prison for treason, which was a legal overthrow of government in 1983, he would probably have been good time because the punishment for treason, the sentence for treason is death. <laughs> Even though I don't support yeah. death sentence, uh, but that would have been the appropriate punishment at that time. So we will not have Nigeria dealing with these characters some 58 years later. It is the inability of Nigeria to bring justice to these guys that have made them to hold Nigeria to ransom or hold Nigeria by the jugular from time to time. It's not only Abu Bakr Atiku, it's not only uh, 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 Muhammad Buhari, it's also you know, a variety of leaders. And I have no apologies about it. That Nigeria hasn't done a good job punishing its criminals. What other countries do all over the world is that regardless of how long it took, they punish their criminals. I think in Cambodia, they just sentenced a few criminals to, uh, you know. In Malaysia. Yeah, they in Malaysia, yeah. they are still punishing military leaders in South America, guys who carried out coups, who carried out torture. In Nigeria, we reward them with bigger political and social promotions. And that is what encouraged these guys to embark on the kind of impunity that you see from time to time in the way they even approach the leadership process with arrogance. So I'm not supposed to be here sitting down, you know, wondering who wins between two criminals. We should have been discussing who wins between the people with the brightest ideas in the country to take Nigeria to the next level. Particularly concerning, you know, uh, you know relating to the fact that the people, these people we are discussing today, We'll take Nigeria backward by several steps. We know that. We know that the only thing Atiku is interested in doing is selling whatever is left. The last time Atiku was in uh, Nigeria's vice president, he was in charge of selling public institutions to private individuals. Sold several of it to themselves. They awarded themselves licenses for university. They sold you know, public um, corporations to themselves. Okay. Now he has even made it clear that his first act in office will be to sell 90% of the NMPC. Let me cut you short. 
But let's um, go straight up to your ambition, you know. Um, the party, you are not seeing this ambition on that a political party, a new political party, That's, yeah. AAC. Yeah. And what we have heard so far is show it for president, show it for president, show it for president. For you to be able to implement these policies, at least you need the majority in the Senate, you need the majority in the House of Representatives, you need to be involved in the grassroots politics. What is the plan of AEC right now? And your other the, the contestants, other contestants vying for other political offers, why are they being quiet so far? Because, like I said, you cannot do this alone. You cannot, if you go there and PDP controls, um, this and the other parties control, it's going to be difficult for you to be able to implement those policies. So, what's your plan? So, you have to understand that the, the, the political party aspect of my contest came two months ago mm -hmm. or there about it. Yeah. I started about eight months ago to be a presidential aspirant looking for a political platform, uh, a political party platform to use to actualize that ambition. In the process, we then discovered we could set up a political party. It was announced about three months ago, I said more than a half now. It became the most political, most popular political party in Nigeria. If I ask you, those of you sitting to my left and right here, mm -hmm. if you knew of any of the 23 political parties that were recently registered, probably you don't. Probably not. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, if I ask you, if you know beyond APC and PDP, if you know 10 other political parties in Nigeria, apart from AAC, you probably don't. It is right. because we took it to that level. But there are other candidates, there are other political candidates. We have about 10 governors, I mean, seven governorship, um, I think 10 governorship candidates. We have about seven senatorial uh, candidates. We have over 100 House of Rep uh, candidates. On that AAC? AAC, yes. Oh. Uh, all these names were submitted and verified a few uh, weeks ago. Uh, so that's what took time. But they are working. You know, you have heard about one guy named Mr. Jolof. Yes. Yeah. yes, exactly, who is very popular. He's an AAC candidate in Delta State. Yeah. So we have several others. We have a governorship candidate, Nigeria Lodja, in Lagos. We have candidates all over the place. So considering when we started, we are doing very well. But I'll go to the question of if you need majority of other parties, I mean your party to be in the, uh, in the, in the National Assembly or not. Let me tell you, you need the majority of the Nigerian people to be behind you as president to succeed. The political parties that you see, you, I ask you a question. Didn't the APC have the majority of senators in the Senate? Majority of House of Rep members in the, in, in the House of Rep? Did the, did the APC have it easy? Because it's not a political party. These are a bunch of greedy individuals who have used political parties as a vehicle to achieve their own agenda, which is to make Nigeria thrive by paying themselves allowances that are criminal in nature. You know, an average Nigerian senator receives more money in terms of, you know, week, I won't say, monthly salary than the President of the United States of America. That is the truth. So we need the Nigerian people, not necessarily senators. If I ask you, if you can find two senators in Nigeria that's working in the interest of Nigerian people, you can't find, you can't name them. You can find four House of Reps members that is working in the interest of Nigerian people. You can't name them because they don't exist. So, but we are starting well. First, if you take the presidency, which is what we will do, the country will be, will be handled by someone who is competent, someone who's got a great heart, someone who's got integrity, someone who is vision-driven, someone who is action-oriented. Mm -hmm. And the things that the president of the country can do alone is enough to put Nigeria on the path of progress. Mm -hmm. The rest, of course, we have to work with mm -hmm. other arms of government. Mm -hmm. There's no question about it. But we are not going to work at their own mercy. We are, they have to work at the mercy of the Nigerian people. 
And if they don't, there are tools to get them removed. <laughs> You can recall the senator, you can recall the House of Rep member. <laughs> Thank you so much for answering that question brilliantly. We're going to go back to Anna Scandio. This is Afro Ethics Social Youth from Apex One Radio. We are broadcasting live from the United States of America. And on the show today, we are having uh, one of the containers of the 2019 election in Nigeria. Omo Yone Shawone is running for the presidency and uh, we are told that uh, general elections will take place in that country on the 16th of February 2019 and of course uh, he is uh, unveiling his uh, political agenda here on the show. I just want to find out uh, this from you. You mentioned earlier on uh, that you've taken your newly created party to that level. When you talk of that level, what do you mean? You don't have seats in parliament, uh, you don't have any uh, political base yet. Nigeria is so, so wide. Are you implanted in all corners of the country? And you think that with just a couple of months old, that party can get to the presidency uh, come uh, February? Absolutely. Uh, the APC, which is the current ruling party, did not produce a presidential candidate until December 2014. So even in terms of preparation, I'm ahead, our party is ahead of where the APC was in 2014 and they eventually went and won the election that was also held in February, uh, I think it was March uh, 2015, yes. And so it is nothing new that a fresh political party, where the political party needs to be first and foremost is the consciousness of the people. The moment you are able to stay there, and then the physical structures become very easy uh, to create. We already have representation in all the 774 local governments of Nigeria. We have 36 state uh, structures uh, in place. I have myself traveled to 30 states in eight months to do town hall meetings. I've been to several cities. I've been to towns, villages in Nigeria, schools. I've been to marketplaces. I've been to a lot of traditional you know, palaces and, you know, uh, places in Nigeria. And I've done the same outside of the country. So in terms of consciousness is what I'm reminding you again, we're there. In terms of structures, we're there. And in the course of building our own structures, we found out that the so-called big political parties, the behemoths, don't have structures. What they have are retail outlets for corrupting the democratic process mm -hmm. in Nigeria, for intimidation of uh, voters, for votes buying, and you can't call those structures. Those are criminal, uh, you know, outlets or food chain. You know, it's the, what we call a pyramid scheme here in the mm -hmm. U.S., where it will look original and genuine to you. But at the end of the, you know, uh, the chain, there is no value added to democracy. But it's just a criminal manipulation of the process. Now, uh, let, let me come again before. Uh, now, there's an original rule. Uh, that power in Nigeria shuttles between the predominantly Muslim North and the Christian South. And so after every eight years, there's this alternation. And it is between the APC and the PTP. Do you think that you are able to dismantle this formula? Absolutely. It's an original rule, but it was a rule made by the elites to game the system. Uh, when it comes to hunger and poverty, there's no rotation of uh, hunger. There's no ethnic consideration, there's no religious consideration. When it is time to steal and share the loot, they don't even speak, you know, any other language but English language, you know, which helps them to facilitate corruption. So we know that, and what we have been able to establish is that Nigerians are no longer fooled by the zoning, what they call it zoning, mm -hmm. by the zoning structure. Nigerians are looking for leaders who can help them climb out of poverty. We can grant them opportunity to, you know, gain their foothold in life, to achieve their full potential, especially young people, 70% of them. They are not encumbered by the lazy man argument of zoning. They have realized, particularly in places where they have been used a lot, that when you zone power to the north, it doesn't end poverty in the north. It doesn't bring education to the average daughter. And in reality, when you pierce through the zoning structure, Nothing is zoned anywhere. It's just a 
you know, a group of political elites who are, you know, uh, engaging in what we call cycle of cushion. You know, the same the poor, be plenty of motion, no movement. At the end of the day, they are the same crime family, you know, established well uh, to get a foothold on Nigeria's political uh, power levers that they use all in their own interest, not in the interest of any zone. Thank you. Before the election of President Buhari, you were the publisher, or you still remain the publisher of Bosnia Report on July? Well, it's, pro pro I mean, it's probably proper to say I'm founder. Okay, yeah. yeah. Founder and publisher of yeah. Bosnia Report. I haven't Reporter. published in a long time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but you still hold Sarah Reporter? I founded it. Yeah. yeah. Did but you I don't, sell it? I, did no, no, it's there. Yeah, okay. Are you but still it's still in is, No, I, I haven't. Like I said, in the last eight months, I haven't even had a chance to scratch uh, we'll, we'll, my we'll, 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 we'll go back to the that. question of yeah. divestment yeah. and the order later on. But now, before 2015, yeah. you know, during the uh, administration of Jonathan, yeah. Jonathan, you were at the forefront of calling out this corrupt act that was going on under this administration. Yes. You published several damning articles about corruption in Nigeria. Yes. And uh, you were also at the forefront of telling Nigerians that we have to you know, change we have to change presidency, that good luck has to go, you know. And uh, you supported President Buhari. And when I was talking to people on Facebook and on my blog about interviewing you today, they were asking me that, do you feel some kind of uh, betrayal or do you feel some sense of uh, betrayal of trust that you put all your trust in Buhari mm -hmm. to reform Nigeria or perhaps to you know, to, to, to fight corruption at its peak, right? I mean, as, as it, you know, at its most basic. Did you really believe that President Buhari could fight corruption? Or, I mean, are you not going to tell Nigerians that, well, I'm sorry, I supported Buhari, but that was a mistake. Are you willing to admit that? You see, you, you have to understand my place in the life of Nigeria in the last 30 years. It will put a lie to some of these things you just mentioned. One, there is no evidence anywhere that I supported Buhari, so that should be taken off the table. I mean, we can say, I, I understand that you didn't, uh, obviously, or, you know, I mean, according, according to support. No, no. When, you say, support when you say somebody is supporting someone, uh -huh. it means in a political sense of it. Yeah. It's an endorsement that someone goes out there to say, hey, you know, we are two candidates, you vote for this. Even in the U.S., the New York Times does and does a candidate. Right. You know, whenever I had elections, I didn't do any of didn't that. Go but let me let me just pull back a little bit, pull you back into history, mm -hmm. and you understand that I started as a student activist in 1989. Yes, I did not support Abiola for the election, but when his mandate was threatened, I supported him to retrieve his mandate. Right. I did not support. Uh, of Aston Job for the election, but when he wanted to do third term, I opposed him. Okay. Yes. You know, I did not support uh, Yaradura for the election, but when he was sick and held the country to ransom and his wife was leading what they call a Yaradura cabal, mm -hmm. we opposed him, and so much so that you could also have made the conclusion mm -hmm. that I supported Good Lord Jonathan coming to office. Well, I'm not going to make that But I, I was I... supporting justice at every time within the political circle in Nigeria. When there is need for justice to be done, I will go for what is just and fair. Okay. And when Jonathan came into office, immediately he started engaging in corruption. Mm -hmm. We started exposing the corruption. Okay. Everybody within the opposition at that time could have capitalized on those uh, reports. Mm -hmm and use it to their own advantage. Okay. It was their right. Mm -hmm. My job as a publisher is to tell the truth mm -hmm. and move on to telling the next truth okay. until truth becomes a dominant currency within our political system. Okay. So that you are very clear about it. Mm -hmm. Immediately Buhari came into office, the first set of damning corrupt stories also emerged from us. Okay. The way they were hiring at uh, the Central Bank of Nigeria, mm -hmm. you know, the way the secretary to the government was involved in corruption. In fact, as Buhari was covering up his illness in London, we were the ones that was exposing it on a daily basis. Everything that they were doing to circumvent the Nigerian process 
or the democratic or undermine the democratic process came from Sahara reporters. To the extent today, if you watch Facebook, um, our greatest enemies are the people you call the Buharis. <laughs> because Absolutely. there's a difference between someone who is consistent about his trade and someone who is, you know, vacillating mm -hmm. about his convictions. Mm -hmm. I do not vacillate. And I've never, that's the reason why people who initially said, oh, you supported Buhari, the moment I kept challenging them, where's the evidence? All of them disappeared. Of course, there were people who felt very bad that Jonathan lost the election. That was the problem, not my problem. You know, and it's very important that people understand. You know, one last thing I would say is that one of the worst things that was done to Nigeria is the fact that they don't teach history. <laughs> yes, yes, if they yes. taught history, I mm. wouldn't have to be I making these explanations. Going to to go back to that. Before we go on this musical break, I'm going to ask you a question before we go on yeah. this musical break. You claim you will be able to, because one of the problems we have in Nigeria right, right, right now is the unemployment rate is at its peak. Yes. And you claim you are going to be able to produce five million plus jobs. In two and a half years. How do you plan to do this? Yes. Alone, we have three areas of intervention that will suck in a lot of unemployed youths. And one of it is the power sector. You know, we have 3,000 megawatts of electricity right now that is hardly enough to probably power a university here in uh, Ohio. And we need to move rapidly 24,000 megawatts of electricity, in which the renewable energy will be a major part of it. You see, if you are doing solar panels, just to put solar panels together alone for 4,500 megawatts of electricity, you need over a million hands, right? We want to double Nigeria's highway system infrastructure. Uh, we have 200,000 kilometers of highway in Nigeria. If we bring in another 200,000, which we dualize every federal highway in the country, that will suck in some 2 million hands that will make it happen. With the, between the construction companies, people who are cutting bush, people who are going to pave the highway, the engineers who are going to keep busy, that is going to bring in about 2 million jobs. Securing Nigeria alone, you know, hiring more policemen, soldiers, you know, equipping them, training them, is going to bring in about 500,000 jobs. Because according to the United Nations, there has to be a number of, you know, policemen to a number of people to know that they are properly policing. But we won't have a terrorism uh, problem, right? In the agricultural sector, where we want to bring in a revolutionary agricultural process for food security, you'll be talking about another 2 million jobs. We have been conservative. And the most important thing I would say would do is to turn Nigeria into a construction site. Mm -hmm. Do you know what we need to do in terms of housing? 17 million units of housing need to be built for us to meet our housing needs. And in ensuring that we go all out to get this done, you're talking about another 2 million jobs. Then we want to hire 200,000 teachers. We want to hire 160,000 health workers in Nigeria. In the terrorism, um, sorry, tourism sector, alone, the kind of investment we want to make there. Honestly, I am telling you that five, five million is just a conservative figure. We, we do what we need to do within such a short time, you know, probably Nigerians will be overworking themselves. Thank you for so much that they, they won't like the president. This president is bringing too much work. This is, this is what you hear. Radio, the edition of the 18th of November 2018, we are broadcasting from the United States of America, precisely from the state of Ohio. Well, before we take a break, I would like to ask you this question. Um, some observers say that, or claim that um, uh, politicians in Nigeria actually use you through Sahara reporters to kick uh, good luck Jonathan out of power. Mm. Now, if that was the case, uh, and it is established that Sahara is uh, a very strong force in Nigerian politics, how is this media outfit going to support you or to let you into Asarok? Well, you know, that's a misconception. A slanderous one for that matter. But I'm not new to such allegations. When I was in the university, I was accused of being used by people to throw out the military out of power. Right? When uh, Obasanjo was running for third term and we opposed it, Obasanjo's people claimed that Atiku was using me 
to oppose the store time agenda. When uh, Yaradua was sick, they said Jonathan was using me to oppose Yaradua uh, uh, to, to get to climb onto power. When uh, Jonathan started misbehaving, they said Buhari was using me to kick him out of power. Now that I'm opposing Buhari, they said the devil is using me. <laughs> <laughs> to fight Nigerian leaders. <laughs> so, you don't uh, okay. understand these people. It's a game. They are playing psychological game with our people. They know that of all the presidential candidates, I have been the most consistent. I have record to show that I have done the same thing all when the time. When you talk about consistency, yeah. what do you mean? Well, like, I have been fighting, you know, as a pro-democracy activist, as a human rights activist, as a media activist in that country all to make Nigeria a better place. And there's ample evidence to show it. If you go to the internet, you see me behind Abiola at the age of 21, fighting to help him retrieve his mandate. Ask me, what did Abiola offer me in 2000 and in 1993? 800,000 Naira called me into his room. He said, young man, you are the leader of the student union in Lagos. You are so powerful. Take this money. 800,000 Naira in 1993 is like $800,000 today, right. almost, in terms of value. I rejected it. At that time, I had two pairs of pants, what we call trousers in Nigeria, and one shirt. And I wasn't attracted to 800,000 Naira. As Sahara reporters, you know how many times I get offered money, you know, in addition to threats. You know, I wouldn't even accept government adverts so that the platform is not compromised. But most importantly to your last question is that the, the platform Sahara Reporters is not part of my campaign team. It is a separate and different entity. And you can go and read Sahara Reporters. In the fact, somebody was complaining, complaining to me the other day that they think that Atiku has brought Sahara Reporters. Because, yes, he went to Google AdSense, placed Google AdSense ads, and targeted Sahara Reporters, which you can do without a Google AdSense. But I didn't even know these things because I haven't had time, like I said, to scratch my eyebrows in the last eight months. Omo Yele Willie is his name. He is uh, a presidential contender for the 2019 election in Nigeria. He is the guest on a for ethics on Apex One Radio today, hosted by Ayo Akinoli, Akintunde. All right, and as kind of, we're going to take a short time for our guest yeah. to catch his breath. And when we come back, the story of his ambitions will definitely continue. Yeah. Yeah. And we're going to take some questions from within the studio. Sure, sure. Yeah. Anyway, anyway, anyway. Yeah. There are a lot of people. Uh, what people don't know about the world. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, yes. I'll, I'll let For me, whoever says it's a hard report is being used by politicians. It's not a Sorry, sorry, sorry. In the studio, we cannot ask all your questions at once and we'll address it. Because we yeah, give you our two. We're not even asking, we're just discussing. Yeah, yeah. This is, oh, okay. Yeah, we're on the break. Yeah, okay, break. break. Yeah, break. Oh, then you can ask this them your uh, questions. It's because they don't read these questions. They don't read... We need to connect. Oh, it's back yeah, on. Yeah, it's back. Okay. okay. So, uh, so we're going back. We actually. He's going to leave. Um, in, two. um, two p.m. He's going to be leaving. So, so I would say we should take two that's questions that's from the studio. Minutes. Then we'll yeah. go about ten minutes. Two questions from the studio. We got to make it short. Then we'll round up. Okay. okay. So, uh, two well, questions from the so studio from our guests in the studio. Then we'll go back to our. Okay. So you go first. Short, short question. Very short question. Let me go. The flight. Go. Hold on. He's going to give you a signal. All right. So we're going back on the airwaves. Then you take the mic. Okay. 
This is Afro Ethics, the edition of uh, November the 18th, 2018. It's a special one, of course, because we're having an August guest here. He's one of uh, the contenders for the 2009 Nigerian presidential bid. Omoyele Shore is his name, he doubles as a major executive. So we have some uh, uh, guests here in the studio with us who are very itchy to uh, ask questions to, to our guests. Uh, let me begin from my extreme uh, right. Uh, you can introduce yourself and you ask okay. yourself very brief. Uh, my name is Dan Alo, uh, former editor for Daily Independent Newspaper, the pioneer ed news editor for Court TV News Nigeria. Um, I'm going to ask this question. I've spoken with uh, Eunice uh, Ato, 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 Ato. She has shown me documents yeah. where you signed and Malcolm signed, and the idea was for all young people aspiring to be Nigeria's president to come together, because if you have described Nigeria's problem as behemoth, you can't confront it all alone. So what that pact was all about is to have all of you come together, form a formidable opposition to tackle the status quo. Why did you opt out? Hmm. Well, this will be, no, no, it's, uh, it's not a hard question. It's actually a very simple question. Where's the second uh, question? The simplicity of it, uh, I will answer by saying this, it's incorrect. It's totally incorrect that I signed any document with uh, Unit at Day or NIP. What happened was that uh, Unit at Tojide met me in London when I went to a town hall meeting there. Said he was in love with our brand of politics and asked us to explore opportunity with her to join her political party, the National Interest Party. And we said before we do that, we want to make a bunch of proposals. I did not oversee that Malcolm was overseeing that. And we actually traveled with her in Nigeria, and I'm addressing this for the first time, I typically ignore her, but this is the international scene now. And when we traveled, we discovered first that her organization, which is her party, has only one person. You know, what we used to describe as non-governmental individuals, one person. We couldn't find any member of our party while we were having conversation with her. We're worried about that. Secondly, she placed before us a debt of 80 million naira that he said the party was owing him and that whatever we do we have to pay him back that money first the money has to be deducted from whatever money we raise before we can start thirdly as we're having the conversation with atujide atujide went and joined cop the coalition that was put together by the pdp right and we said to her how can you be having conversation with us? Are you going to join the PDP? This was, this was uh, publicized. Uh, the contradictions were clear that I think today wasn't interested, you know, in having a vibrant presidential candidate. I think she was just throwing her nets all over the place, see, you know, hoping that it will catch somebody. And the moment we saw through the falsehoods, you know. The dishonesty that characterized the conversation, we pulled that. There was no signature whatsoever. Ask her this simple question that when she went and signed the pact with COP, which is a PDP coalition, how did she sign? When she showed you document, can you please provide the document public? Don't send it to me, you know, so that you can compare my own signature with that. Malcolm was the one leading the conversation with her. And the moment we discovered that. There was total dishonesty and inconsistency as to what she stood for and what we stand for. We decided to okay. end the conversation. There was no signing of any documentation. How about pact? Pact, did I, did not, I did not attend. No, no, you attended. We, we're we're going to go to the no, next question. No, 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 no problem, don't worry. No, let, me, let me answer that okay. part before okay. we go. Okay. Okay. It's, it's very important. Pact is very important, please. The Nigerians are listening. I attended only one meeting of PACT, yes. and my suggestion when I got there was that I met 18 presidential aspirants, about 10 of them I'd never seen before. I advised them immediately. I said, where did you bring all these guys from? I never heard about them, even though I'm not a cyclopodia of uh, presidential aspirants. I said, why don't you wait 
let all of us become presidential candidates and we can then come together they mm. said no that day i left parts and never went back to parts we're going to take the next question from mr yes. femi or shabi yeah go ahead with your question sir uh, uh my name is uh femi or i work with the uh Ohio state department of public safety i'm a cyber security analyst mm -hmm. and um my question will be very brief and i think uh mr Allot take part of the question uh, I have to compliment you what you're doing. I've been following Sahara Provide for a very long time, and uh, that's a lot of compliment on that. And I will keep supporting you on my part. Thank and, you. And uh, a lot of your, my friends in Maryland, Virginia, they all support you. We're on, the, we're on the path with you. But my question is part of going to be part B of what Mr. Alloy is asking you, and I'll make it straight. Um, someone like Fela Durotoye and, uh, and Kingsley, Magu Mugalu. 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 I and another person is called Mohammed Buhari. Yes. If a very young uh, Ahmed Buhari. Ahmed Buhari. Yes. Um I believe to take out this Kabar, the APC and the PDP in Nigeria, there gotta be a correlation. And I strongly believe that. This is a question I've been pounding in my heart forever. Yes. And I have the opportunity to ask you now. There got to be a fine print between the coalition, between you. I understand your principle, I understand what you base on, but among all those guys, one or two or three person have to be with you for you guys to come together on this thing. Please, can you shed more light on that? Thank you. I completely think that it will happen. It's a matter of time. And the reason why it will happen is that over time, boys will be separated from men. And men will be separated from the old men. And what has happened with all these young candidates is that a lot of them want to make their foot, you know, they want to make an impression on the political process. I'm not trying to make an impression on the political process. The question you should ask yourself is in 1993, where was Morgan? You've never heard about him until now. Yes, he was, he became the vice, I mean, the deputy governor of uh, the Central Bank of Nigeria. An employment provided by connection. I have never had those kind of opportunities before because I never sought those kind of advantage. Yes. I've always fought for what is just and right. The second question you ask yourself is everybody who is running for presidency actually running on behalf of principle? A lot of them are sponsored by third parties. I don't know who is who, but my experience with Eunice, for example, showed to me that when you see someone who just come from the blues, be very careful. Especially when they are in their, when they are old enough to have engaged in other things, and they never did anything for Nigeria. The way I judge it is that, at least if we didn't fight during June 12, at least in 2012 when we did occupy Nigeria, we would have seen you do something in the life of the country if you believe in fighting for Nigeria. The last thing I will say to you regarding this coalition you are asking for is that. You're asking of coalition of parties. What about coalition of persons ideas. and ideas? There are a lot of people who are lined up behind us. Today, if you read Vanguard newspaper, they said they conducted a poll, had no hand in it, but they said Buhari won, Atiku was second, Shewere was third. You know, Shewere that didn't have $100,000. I have not raised up to that $100,000. Atiku has already spent $16 million, $20 million at the primaries of PDP. Buhari has the Central Bank of Nigeria in his hand. But yet, me, nobody from nowhere, is trailing at number three. That's a poll that was conducted by an independent group. But the truth is that in the real genetic and organic sense of it, the outrage in the country will propel us to number one very soon. And that's what you should focus on. Thank you so much. Take it back. Take it back. Thank you so much. Action. We're going to take one more question from Precious. Go ahead with your question. Hi, thank you so much. My name is Precious, and I'm, I'm alumnus from University of Lagos. I was part of the uh, movement for the um, uh, Student Union in 2017. We were able to bring wow. back Student Union in the University of Lagos. Yeah. Now, my question is this, and I'm going to be very pragmatic here. I was, um, I'm always in Nigeria. I will be in Nigeria for the elections. I'm seeing what happened in Oshun, in the Oshun State elections. I know a lot of youths are going to vote for you. I myself will vote for you if I have my PVC. How do you intend to protect your votes, knowing this man will go above and beyond to secure that position? Yeah. You see, I have said it, and this is very important. Listen to me very carefully. This is both an election and a revolution that's about to happen. If they mismanage one, it will lead to the other. If they mismanage the election, it will lead to a revolution. 
because we have reached a point, breaking point for Nigerians. And Nigerians are saying enough is enough. And what you're seeing is a coalition not of persons and their angst, anger, and frustration is also of a desire to have a country that would propel them, that they can be hopeful about, that will give them the opportunities they need in life. They might have gotten away with Osho states and Ekiti state. It is because a lot of Nigerians are not concerned about those two places. But this national election is an election of an existential nature. It's about the existence of the Nigerian soul. And people will go to every length to protect it. So those who are planning to rig the election, people who are planning to see and buy, they will be shocked. Yes, One last thing I will say to you. Yes, no, Take it back. Take it back. Action. Action. Nigeria has actually been here before. We were here during the June 12th election, where everybody thought that the richest or the most manipulated group would win the election. They lost out. It also happened in 2014 here, 2015. Everybody thought that with the money that PDP was deploying dollars as if it was going out of circulation. But they lost the election because people said, for some people mistakenly, that Buhari would give them you know, a different kind of in, in, in a new lease of life. That did not happen. So Nigerians are a little bit more sophisticated than Let me take this you know, question. the assumptions that you have that they can get away with everything. They are themselves, they know it. I'm going to ask this question, then I'll go back to you, then we'll go back to you and you. Now, when it comes to sensitizing the citizens of Nigeria, because that's one of the most important things, one thing that we've seen so far, like Precious said, that apart from this, um, the cabal snatching the, um, you know, the ballot boxes and all that, com co co uh, creating commotions during elections to rig the elections, one thing that's so important is sensitizing our people to make sure, to let them understand that, you know, the vote, this vote determines your future. Mm -hmm. What are you doing when it comes to sensitizing the citizens of Nigeria right now about the importance of this election and, and how to ensure that they do not sell their vote to the wrong people and make sure they vote the right candidate with the right ideologies to take Nigeria to the next level? What do you think we are doing here in the last one hour? Hmm. Sensitization. You but think you, 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 yeah, no, I know what you're trying to say that if you don't go on the ground, talking about grassroots now. you have not understood that the grassroots has also evolved over the years. As we are here, people are watching us. If I get out of here, I'll get a call from my grandmother in Undo States, <laughs> and you said, Son, I just watched you on Facebook Live. Do you know that my grandmother watched Facebook Live? Do you know that when she can't watch, somebody will go and translate and interpret to her? It's part of it. But I'm not discountenancing the fact that we need to put boots on the ground. Yes, and we're exactly doing that. Right. You know, nobody has done it better. In fact, if you ask who amongst the presidential aspirants and later candidates has done the most campaigning in this particular election cycle, they'll point to no other person than myself. Hey, yes, so take it back. That one is not take a problem. It back. Right, Action. So the yes. reason why we're out here is to get more empowerment, get more materials, get more support to be able to do it, you know, to do what America used to call shock and awe in Nigeria. Come next year. Special edition of Afro-Ethics, <laughs> reaching you from Columbus of the United States of America. We have uh, Omo Yele Shore as main guest on the show. He is a presidential contender in the 2019 election in Nigeria. Okay, so... um. Uh, we um, one last thought, uh, the close of the show. Um, I don't know. We're going, definitely going to end with him. But then um, I would just crave your indulgence uh, uh, to take one last question from 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 the crowd. He is Mayo Akinde. He is uh, a Nigerian, uh, uh, an American, who is also a politician, and he is one for civil elections in the state of Ohio as well. He has the last question for you. Yeah, um, I'm glad to meet you. I uh, heard much about you. Actually, this past couple of weeks, I'm impressed. You know, of course, uh, I'm not so in depth in Nigerian politics at this, at this point, uh, but I know how bad things are, and yeah. I know uh, people have had attempts in the past. A lot of things I've heard from you, I'm impressed. I think it's actually doable. But I think there's some kind of way you need that revolution to be generated by some kind of power around the diaspora. So you're here today. So. Um, what what is your ask from people that, people that because the end that's what you gotta have an ask coming out here so yeah. um, and just pretty much break it down how that would happen because some there's a lot of us here who are not active enough mm -hmm. we talk about the problem but we don't think about solution we don't think about being involved in solution so 
Uh, what is your ask from each individual who are Nigerians in the uh, diaspora? Thank you, and I'm going to go straight to it. We, the diaspora community uh, is Nigeria's gold. We provide the most amount of revenue to Nigeria besides oil. Uh, over $70 billion has already been shipped to Nigeria this year from the diaspora alone. And what we are asking is to get the support because we don't have godfathers and godmothers supporting us. As you know, they hate us with passion. And that hatred is mutual. We hate them too. I mean, uh, quote and unquote. But we need people in the diaspora. Our ask is for 10,000 Nigerians living out here in Europe, everywhere, to donate $200 each to us. And that will put us at $2 million advantage to fight. I mean, $2 million advantage, dollars advantage to fight this behemoth you're talking about. We have particular advantage that nobody in Nigeria expects us to buy them rice, you know, or any piece of clothing to bribe them on election day. People are asking us to demonstrate that, you know, ideas can become the new currency of politicking. And they have come to accept that we are versed in ideas. And uh, so whomever can uh, support us financially, or if you have a home that's lying around in Nigeria, you have a vehicle that we can brand, or you can donate posters to us, stickers, you can donate flyers to us, t-shirts, hats, all those things that make politics great, uh, look nice, and make them modern and civilized is what we're asking for. We're not asking for anybody to send us a gift for seven dollars or bullets. We need for this idea. Well, you know, the revolution will take care of itself. The last question from uh, uh, my co host, then we'll be uh, uh, finding out what brought uh, uh, the presidential aspirant to Columbus. Then so it will be at the end of the show. So, uh, I can do it. But thank you. So, my own area of expertise is uh, corruption. I investigate uh, the corruption in America, for corruption, and all that. And this is what I'm going to ask you right now. So, if you can't fight corruption in Nigeria with the current uh, mechanism that we have in place, right? If it goes to Ukraine right now, they have uh, the United Nations and other external uh, anti-corruption agencies helping Ukraine fight corruption. If you go to Malaysia right now, you will see the Justice Department in the United States trying to help Malaysia to fight corruption. If you were elected as president of Nigeria, Will you be willing to bring in external special prosecutors to prosecute corrupt Nigerians? That's my first question. Number one, that won't violate our, our sovereignty, by the way. That's the rule of God. Now, number two, when you become the president of Nigeria, are you willing to create a blind trust to put your interest or your stake in our uh, salary reporters separately? You know, are you going to open a blind trust that would, you know? That will create like uh, an incumbrance between you and what Sarah thought that does. And you would need to create a blind trust, a real blind trust. Oh, yeah, absolutely. That's a, an easy thing to do. In fact, I'm divested from Sarah reporters a lot. Right now. Yes, of course. In, completely divested. Well, not completely in the sense that, you know, the operation in Lagos, I'm completely not involved anymore. And I'm not involved in day to day running of Sarah reporters. Okay. That's what I mean by divestment. Okay. But in terms of a legal structure to put Everything I have, will be, you know, will, that's easy, and I will do that, okay. including declaring my assets, which okay. is very important. All right, we're going to take one uh, more so, last so, question. So, the question. Last question. The last question. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Is that you know, hey, bringing in forensic investigators, prosecutors, that's something I would be very, very happy to do. And you better go get your visa if you don't have one already. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to take this last question from so, Mr. Uh, yeah, you know, I'll be remiss to not to mention this because one of the things that actually, uh, I guess, got me excited and made me feel like maybe that perhaps I can support. But, uh, you know, I, guess I have my limitations how much I can support since I've run for, I've run for office here. My plans run for office here in the future. So one of the things that I think that would help, help gain more steam in what you're doing is the idea that you already had, but it's not being put out there enough, that you actually are willing to uh, give those citizenship to African Americans who do the DNA testing. Yeah. Well, so that's one issue I think that you should talk about more, because people like Malcolm X, you know, went yeah. to AU back in the, in the 60s mm -hmm. to try to, right. to, try to uh, uh, gain this bond that we can have with people overseas. You know, so, uh, so definitely um, I think that's something that we need to talk about more. So if people who are living here in the United States can talk to all that, multi-generation African-American mm -hmm. friends, 
uh, first and second generations out there listening. Talk to your multi-generation African American friends. Let them know that if if one day they do decide that they want to. Go to Africa, Relocate, yeah. They, so they, they, we'll they, provide they, a home for you. Talk more about it. Yeah. And our, our decision is that if when you do your DNA and it points to Nigeria, you will have the rights to travel to Nigeria visa free if you are African American uh, throughout our tenure. I will make sure that it becomes institutionalized, you know, because we need you as much as you need us. My heart bleeds that you know the black community of you know blacks on the continent of Africa and blacks here on this side of the world have not come together to create a formidable global force to stop the kind of oppression and humiliation of the black race. And that is why if we need Nigeria to get it right. The moment Nigeria gets it right, you will see a difference in your lives here too. Because then we can all work together to make sure that the dignity of the black man, whether it's in Ohio, or in Lagos, or you know, in uh, Zimbabwe, is upheld. So what are you speaking uh, like a pan Africanist, which of course he is, and of course the presidential contender is here in uh, the state of Ohio, precisely in the city of Colombo. So what brings you here? I came here for a fundraiser, and it's happening to, uh, this afternoon here in uh, in Columbus. I've heard that a lot of professionals here. Uh, I'm not only uh, interested in your money, I'm interested in recruiting you to go back home. Uh, when Take we it back! President Nigeria. Uh, so next year, we're going to need a lot Take of you. It so okay. it's at uh, 4254 Cleveland Avenue. Hey, Columbus. Uh, zip code is 43224. All right. So, the members have definitely gone across. Uh, this is uh, Afro ethics that is running off. But then, um, we uh, have this uh, little uh, message. So, this is away from politics, uh, Shore. It's totally away from politics. We are a media organization, so we don't do partisan politics. But then, um, we have been uh, following up Saharan reporters. I'm as a media entity, I think it's inspired a lot of Africans, especially those who do the kind of things we do as, as, as a media. And I think it's time Africa should step up as well, because we have CNN, Fox, RFE, VOE, that project the Western democracy and of course Western societies. And so if we have African media entities with that kind of strength, that tell the African story, the African way, I think we are just inspired and glad. So we want to congratulate you on the job you are doing uh, as far as Sahara Reporters is concerned. And so our Text One Radio has a surprise for you. Wow. Uh, the general manager is going to just to uh, congratulate you on the great job you're doing uh, for you. Sahara I uh, having inspired. Uh, other media initiatives. Yes. Mm. Mm. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you so very much, mm. sir. Thank you. We are really privileged to have you in our studios. And on behalf of Apex One Radio, we say thank you so very much, and we wish you success in all your endeavors. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. Thank you, Apex Radio here, yeah, Apex One Radio. Yeah, yes. Thank you, Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, and uh, you know I promise to be here yes, sir. with. Uh, my entire crew yes, yes. when I become president of Nigeria. <laughs> <laughs>